Good evening, folks. Good to have you with us here again for this brief devotional on this Wednesday evening. I hope that the time that we spend on Wednesdays are, are a real blessing. In fact, uh, Ben and I have talked and we thought uh, this would be a good idea. He suggested, hey, why don't we continue to where each week there will be some devotional thoughts that we can share on Wednesdays to where uh, if by chance you don't make it to the Wednesday service, that you can at least log in here and enjoy this. Anyway, something we're considering. But I want you to look this evening at Philippians chapter 1. All right, something interesting that came to me as I was meditating and memorizing this passage uh, in the last couple of weeks that I wanted to share with you. So look at, look at Philippians chapter 1. Now, we are fully aware of what Paul is doing as he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. And he informs them that, you know, there is something that has really changed and turned out for a good thing in my circumstances that I'm facing in this confinement, this imprisonment, <laughs> quarantine, whatever you'd like to call it. He, of course, was chained in prison. He was a house arrest, but really he was confined just much like you and I are. We've been confined these weeks, but he said, you know, there's some good things that came from this. There were positives that maybe even he didn't anticipate. He said, well, first of all, all of this news about my imprisonment has gotten out and around but remember, it was for the cause of Christ. And that's what's so unique and special about it, that people normally that wouldn't be talking about Christ are talking about this because of, by virtue of my imprisonment. So whenever they did, as the news spread, everybody began to know about it. Everybody began to talk about it. But he said the second thing was that many brethren who before time weren't as bold and brave to speak now speak the word of God with great courage and without fear now it was a good thing so it really prompted something in these individuals to take a bold stand and do something and I think if you were are careful to measure your days as you've been confined count your blessings start counting and figuring up you know, there are some things that have been different, but in a good way. This is what Paul's talking about. So let's go on down. The main verse I want to focus on is verse 20. But please join me as we come into verse 18. He says, well, then, what then? Um, I mean, what can we say about all of this? See, that all of this is going to, as it's turning out for something good, he says, what then? Well, only that in every way, whether through pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And he said, you know what? I'm going to rejoice in that. Yes, I want you to know, to be sure. I will continue to rejoice. He said, for I know, because... I know that this, all of this that's happened, all of this that's taken place will turn out for my deliverance. Now, in some way, he would be delivered from this. Well, he, either through death or he would be let go and he could live to preach another day. But he said now, now notice as we go in to verse 19, he said, this is going to turn out for my deliverance, my rescue. How is that going to be accomplished? Well, look at verse 19. It's going to be through two major avenues. Number one, he says, through your prayers. You upholding me in prayer. And the second main avenue was the provision, the supply of what the Spirit of Jesus Christ will give me. So if we were to kind of paraphrase this, he's just saying, listen, it's through you you and your loved ones and all that we can get together, join together in prayer, your prayers, your consistent praying for me. Prayers are a wonderful thing. Listen, do you pray for others? 
have you thought about others? I know we want to pray for ourselves, but you know, there are some that are in a worse situation than you are. Well, do you pray for them? Uh, do you pray for me? And then he says, through what the Holy Spirit, the superabundant supply of what the Spirit of Jesus Christ will give me. So the King James really expresses it well. Supply, the help, the provision, that supply of only what God can give. That's how you're going to make it through. That's how we can be bold. That's how we'll get through this situation and anything else that comes along. It's what Jesus Christ will supply us through his spirit. Now, look at verse 20. He says, now I want you to know something important. Verse 20, we could just almost cut right in two. Why? Because there are two parallel clauses here that are butted up against each other. They relate to one another. One supplements the other. One is an additional thought and supplement to help explain the first clause. What is it? Well, look at it. According to my earnest, my eager expectation. What does that mean? Well, the word was used for a sentry who was at his lookout point where he was very earn, in earnest searching for the enemy, looking for any sign of the enemy coming. Looking, or it could be a sentry who was looking for the signal from the general of when to charge. But it's got the idea of your head, neck, being outstretched, focused, strained on looking for that signal. To keep an eager lookout. That's what he was talking about. And so it's used in a grammatical sense about a great expectation. I'm waiting for something with great in, a suspense. It's Paul's anxious and persistent expectation. Well, what is it, Paul, that you have such great expectations for? That was the first thing. And then the second thing, a hope. The hope he had and what lay ahead of what God was going to do through all of these circumstances. And so there's that first part. Here's my earnest expectation and hope. Well, what is it, Paul? What, what are you expecting? Well, the next clause then, that in no way that I shall be ashamed or that I will not be put to shame that in nothing, nothing in my life would cause shame and disgrace on Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. He says that I won't be ashamed, but then boldness. He still prays for boldness. Back when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, he says, persevere in prayer with for me that I'll have boldness to speak as I ought to speak. Here again, he wants that boldness as always, and that Jesus Christ, even right now, as always, that he will be magnified, exalted, and uplifted, and glorified in my life, whether by life or by death, whether I can continue to live for him, or if I die, if, if this is my time, and I, I face the gallows from this imprisonment, I want Christ to be glorified and honored. So, there are simple things. Nothing great and profound. Yet they have a profound effect on Paul, just as they should on us. Three simple things he brings to our attention that he wanted, that he shares, I hope that you would want. Now, he, he did not want to be ashamed. He did not want to do anything that would put shame or bring shame upon himself. Now, the reason he says upon myself is because my life reflects Christ. I live for Christ. I am his. I exalt. My life revolves around him. So Paul's life equals the Christ life. In other words, everything I do is for Jesus Christ. That's why he says, I, I don't want anything to come on me and put me to shame. In other words, my testimony, my ministry, 
my impact I can make for Christ. So in an indirect way, no, I don't want to do anything that would bring shame on Christ. Okay. And then I want to be able, as I face some uncertainties and I face some real challenges, Lord, I want boldness. And then of course, uh, above all, no matter what happens, Lord, I want you to be uplifted and magnified in my life. Now, how can these three things be accomplished in your life? Well, number one, he said back up earlier in verse 19, prayers. Folks, would you pray for me? Would, would you pray that I will not, as a pastor, not do anything that would bring shame upon and reproach upon the name of Christ or the ministry? That I would not, in, in essence, as I not do something that puts shame on me because it reflects Christ. It reflects North Baptist. So would you pray for me? But would you pray for others? See, the same, uh, the same message comes back to me. Okay, well, I pray for you that you won't be put to shame, but that you would stand honorably uh, for the Lord and bold for him and speak as you should for him praying for one another, and then not to forget, we're able to get through all of this. We're able to face whatever may change in our country. It's through what Christ provides, the sub abundant supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's what keeps us going. So three simple truths. He shares that he desired that you ought to desire. What's that? Well, number one, don't do anything. Don't live in any way that would bring shame upon Christ. Make sure that your life reflects Jesus Christ. Don't do something you'll be ashamed of. Don't, don't, don't do something that would shame your wife, shame your husband or your children or your uh, relatives or your church family. Don't do something that brings such a bad mark because that would reflect the grace of Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing. Determine and pray and ask God, help me that I would only honor you. Second thing, boldness. Lord, give me boldness. Now, Paul prayed for that. I mentioned earlier when he wrote to the church at Ephesus, you know, persevere in prayer, praying that I will have the boldness to speak as I ought to speak. Now, here's Paul. I look at Paul as a brave character. Uh, far braver and bolder than I am. But there was times he said, you know, pray that the Lord will help me to have boldness as I should. That's very critical. You want that boldness. Lord, whatever happens, I just want to do right and I want to speak honorably for you. And then the third truth he shares is that you, literally, you would be made great. You would just radiate your fullness through my life. That's what I pray for through my body, my actions, my attitude, that everything would be made great for Christ, magnified, exalted, whatever I can do, Lord, to honor you, to uplift your name. Help me to do that and not to do anything that would disgrace the cause of Christ. Now, we don't know uh, what's gonna be happening. There's, there's been some changes, and I know that we're not happy with some of what's gone on. I think the government may have overstretched their, their bounds here, but still, we know that God's in control. Why, why don't we determine and make this our prayer and determine, no, I wanna reflect Christ. I want him to be glorified. I want to have boldness to do what's right because when I go talk to others, I want to have the right spirit and attitude. So that means I don't want to go around complaining. Why do we complain and why? I know I don't like certain things. You probably don't. Okay, maybe it is wrong, but whether it is or not is not the point. Point is, is that through it, I don't want to do something that would bring shame. And I think when we stand for, for our rights that we have through our our governmental process, then just determine that I will not speak ill or insulting anyone or any public figure, that I'll be respectful, 
because I know that as I stand and speak like that, I'm reflecting Jesus, his words, his attitude, his spirit. And that's what I want to do. So I hope you'll desire that your greatest desire is that you won't do anything to bring disgrace to Christ. Lord, help me to be bold as I should be. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for these words. And now I pray your blessings on this time in Jesus name. Amen.